What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and we've just covered how Solo Kata came about and how they still had some room for improvement. So the next stage of Kata development was, naturally, making those improvements. The Kaisai no Genri assumes that Kata were created on purpose, with a structure and with some degree of intent of being a useful practice method. For these stage 2 kata, they were not particularly composed with a structure, at least not one according to this theory. Instead, they were just strung together out of existing drills, and really shouldn't need that much interpretation. In fact, ideally, they would be taught alongside those drills, alongside stage 1 kumite kata. So the connection between the technique and its solo form would be obvious. These kata weren't constructed with a lot of rules, and therefore you don't really need rules to interpret them. Either you're taught the interpretation, or you've lost it and have to try to directly fit each technique to what it's responding to as if it were a puzzle piece. Stage 3 kata, however, were constructed, or rather, compressed, according to a certain set of rules. Obviously, part of the reason for this was to make the kata itself shorter and more able to be performed in tight spaces. A lot of these rules are limits on motion or on balance. Essentially, if you take a step to the left, you should balance it out with a step to the right. They also take a fair number of pains to avoid redundancy, so that you're not doing 10 variations of the same technique in the same form. These various limitations that were imposed resulted in forms that could take 8 or 5 or even less than 1 minute to practice, meaning both that you could practice in more dispersed bursts of time throughout the day, and that each individual technique could be drilled many times during the same length of a practice session. If it takes you two 30 minute forms to finish your entire 1 hour of practice, then you're only really going to get 2 reps of each technique in. With this condensed format, however, you could get as many as 60 reps of each technique in that same amount of time. However, Tamano sensei also gives another interpretation as to why this set of rules was adopted. Personally speaking, I'm not sure that I agree with this interpretation, or rather with the idea that this was a primary concern for most of the Chinese martial artists who participated in this process. However, in order to be fair, I'm going to present this idea and then briefly say why I don't think it's necessarily as big a part of the history as Tamano Sensei asserts it to be. This reason was that it supposedly helped to keep the techniques in each kata from being stolen by other styles. With stage 2 kata, what you see is what you get. So if a member of a different lineage, or worse, a political enemy who happens to know martial arts, catches a glimpse of your practice, they could guess fairly accurately at what you were trying to do. However, like with a code or cipher, if you just change the techniques at random, not only do you run the risk of creating new techniques that don't actually use the body mechanics of your own techniques, but you also make it impossible to decrypt the new stage 3 kata back to their original kumite kata form. Therefore, the rules that they used to convert these techniques into their condensed form also serve as the key to the cipher of kata, without which, no matter how perfectly another style copies your kata, they can't accurately understand the intention of it. Because of their importance, therefore, that set of rules was kept as a very closely guarded secret within each style. Now as far as I know, there might be some validity to this understanding. According to Tamano Sensei's historical account, many of the styles of Chinese martial arts which still to this day use this sort of condensed stage 3 kata, were located either in Fujian or Guangdong, areas where a lot of Ming Dynasty officials hid from the Qing Dynasty and plotted a return to Han Chinese rule over the at that time Manchurian dominated imperial institution. But I don't fully agree that for previous stages of kata, that simply viewing them would be enough to understand their intent and meaning. Even for me personally, with almost two decades of practice and with written explanations of the techniques, when I view certain advanced Yakusoku Kumite drills, it's still a struggle to figure out what on earth they're doing, whether they are in picture form or even video form. Additionally, it is entirely possible for a style to happen to discover an effective technique without having to take it from another style. 
much like explanations that karate was practiced to keep secret from the Satsuma Domain soldiers the secret fighting potential of Ryukyuan peasants, I think that this theory has very little evidence to back it up. However, I also think that it is undeniable that the kata were shortened, and that this was done according to some set of rules. These shortened katas were the ones which were, by and large, introduced to the Ryukyu kingdoms during the 18th and 19th centuries, and which, when mixed with indigenous Ryukyuan fighting practices, became the basis for the karate that we practice today. It is also important to remember, from an historical perspective, that these rules were probably developed more by trial and error and over many successive generations rather than just by one person at one time. In fact, it might be a little bit better to call them not rules but general guidelines since for most of them you can likely find exceptions if you know where to look. However, if you take a look at even the most compressed Chinese forms and then at karate kata, you'll notice that while they do sometimes have quite a few similarities, they are far from the same forms. Has something just been lost in translation? Well, maybe some things have, but there is still one more step in kata's development that brought us to the kata that we practice, or not if your style doesn't do kata, today.